Hello, everybody, and welcome to uh, this webinar. We are uh, going to get started in about a minute or so. Uh, there are still a bunch of people uh, joining this webinar. Uh, so we'll give people about a minute or so. So hang tight, and uh, we will get started with our demo and discussions of uh, what's new in Release 51 of ViewPathDB resources. All right. Well, welcome, everybody. We'll go ahead and get started. Uh, so uh, my name is Omar Harb, and I'm part of the outreach team at uh, the Euka Eukaryotic Pathogen Vector and Host Informatics Resources. Um, as many of you know, this is a um, NIH um, uh, NIAID-funded uh, bioinformatic resource center. Uh, it's one of two resource centers in the U.S., uh, one of them, which is uh, ViewPathDB, which focuses on eukaryotic pathogens, vectors, and their hosts, and, and the host of the pathogens. Um, in addition, there's another bioinformatic resource center that focuses on uh, bacteria and viruses. Um, and so uh, there are a lot of uh, informatics resources for you to be able to do your work. Um, today, uh, I'm joined by Evelina Basenko, who's at the University of Liverpool. Uh, Sam Rund at the University of Notre Dame and Suzanne Warnfeld at the University of Georgia. We will all be presenting uh, different bits of this uh, uh, webinar. And um, uh, specifically, let me, so specifically, this is the general outline. You don't have to remember this, obviously, but just to give you a, a framework, um, I'm going to give you a little bit of a bit more introduction before I hand over the presentation to Suzanne, who's going to tell you about our new feature, uh, Multi Seek Blast. Uh, and then we'll switch over to the various databases and tools that we have uh, and cover um, some highlights from each of these resources. Obviously, an, an hour is not enough for you, us to cover every single data set uh, in these resources, but hopefully we will give you a flavor of what's new and we will demo some of the tools and how to um, search these uh, data. So um, ViewPathDB resources includes um, uh, hundreds of organisms across uh, the various uh, organisms that we support, including uh, various parasites, uh, fungi, uh, and also we include uh, vectors. Um, and also we have a database called HostDB, which will be demoed by Eve a bit later on uh, to highlight some of our host response uh, data that we include in the, in the resource. All of our resources uh, they are built on the same infrastructure. So if you jump around, whether you're in ViewPathDB or you go to TriTripDB, which is essentially a view of ViewPathDB, but filtered down to only include the trypanosomatids or Candidoplastida. And so this uh, gives you sort of a, an ability to look more narrowly at, at those organisms. Or if you switch to vector base, which will include ob obviously the arthropods and various vectors, uh, it looks the same. Uh, it just has now a uh, essentially a filter that only sh um, limits your uh, data on, on vectors. And here's PlasmoDB. I'm just illustrating these three databases to show you that they are they look the same and 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 uh, have the same look and feel. Obviously, there'll be slightly different data. You know, if, if a particular experiment is available for Plasmodium, uh, it may not be available for T. brucei, for example. And so those will be um, some differences, but those are in, in data content. Um, one thing I wanted to point out to you is that uh, we do have under our help section, the section called learn how to use ViewPathDB. 
Um, if you are new to the resource, uh, you should make this page your best friend because it includes a lot of uh, useful tools and resources, including uh, a list of all of our webinars. And this is um, all upcoming webinars and previous webinars. So you'll see here we have a number of webinars already scheduled for, for the year and even moving into 2022, and there will be more. So we will schedule more over the coming months throughout uh, this. So I would encourage you to come back and visit this page frequently. Um, we also include a list of all of our previous webinars and a link to their recordings. And so if you know that you've missed a webinar on Go uh, enrichment, for example, in UPathDB, and you think, oh man, you wish you would have attended that, well, you can come here. This was uh, presented on May 28th. You can click on it. It'll take you down to the section here, which gives you a bit more description and a link to the YouTube or any handouts that were provided. And so all of this is available to you. The other thing I wanted to um, mention to you, so if we go back to the um, help page here, we have uh, all of our workshops are published online and made available to you. And so you can follow them, you know, you can essentially do your own workshop by following the, um, uh, a particular workshop that we've run in the past. Um, we have additional exercises that a lot walk you through step-by-step -step instructions and basically give you a, a, a almost like a um, um, an, an exercise to run as you learn how to uh, navigate the site. Um, and then I would want to point you out to this calendar here, which is a, um, a, a NIAID Bioinformatics Resource Center calendar of events. So this includes not only events from ViewPath TV, but also events from um, the other uh, uh, the, the viral and bacterial uh, bioinformatic resource center. And you'll see here that there are a number of webinars scheduled and, and you can obviously scroll through the calendar or subscribe to this calendar if you have access to, to Google, which most of us do. And you can uh, then see what's new or have it on your calendar of, of events as you move forward. Okay, um, in terms of what's new in our resources, so we have a news and tweets section right here on the right section. And for every release, we, we publish notes, basically, that describe what's new in a particular release. And ViewPathDB sort of aggregates all of the, the news for the different sites. It's a nice place where you can go and, and click here and, and look at this. And then you can see a listing of all the news uh, for all the sites. And you can scroll down and see, see what's new. Um, one big thing I wanted to point out is that we when we add a new feature, it typically, unless it's really specific to a particular organism, but typically that feature becomes available for all of our resources. So for example, Suzanne will demo the multi-blast uh, seek tool uh, in the next section, and uh, this tool is made available for all of our sites. And so, um, uh, and then again, the same thing, these features are all made available throughout the site. Okay, so I think I will stop here. And Suzanne, I'm gonna switch it to you to talk about uh, Multiblast. Actually, one quick thing, uh, this is just a housekeeping for GoToWebinar. If you want to ask a question, feel free to uh, click on your questions pane in your GoToWebinar panel, and you can type your question there. Um, you know, All of us here on the panel will be answering these questions. And we're also joined by Sarah Kelly, who's also part of the outreach team and will be answering questions as well. Um, and as always, and this will be mentioned throughout our webinar. If you have questions about something you saw today, or if you're on our website and you're trying something out and, and you, you need more information, or you want to let us know about new data sets that we should be integrating, uh, you can always click on this Contact Us link right here at the, in the menu bar. And uh, we typically try and answer questions within 48 hours. And, and we, uh, we welcome any kind of question. So feel free to send us questions at any moment. All right, Suzanne, I will uh, go ahead and switch it to you. All right, all yours. Okay, do you see a slide? Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay, good. Um, so I'll talk, uh, you know, give the 30 second definition of um, BLAST, and then I'll move on to show our new tool, which is multi-seq uh, capable BLAST tool. All right, so uh, BLAST stands for Basic Local Alignment Search Tool, and it's a program that finds regions of local similarity between sequences. The, pro the program compares nucleotide and protein sequences to a sequence database and then calculates the statistical significance of the matches. We use the NCBI BLAST algorithm for all of the BLASTs initiated at, from all of our sites. 
And this um, NCBI has a great um, help section on their BLAST page. Um, you can look at there. There's also um, an, an actual chapter written about um, how they do their BLASTs. OK, so I'm going to move on to demo this in Vectorbase. Um, all right so uh, blast beta is our new tool that is multi blast capable you can query up to 100 sequences at once with this tool it's available from the tools menu under blast beta and it will eventually replace our um, present blast tool which uh, you can only blast one sequence at a time from there so i'll go ahead and open that tool and what I see is a page where I have five parameters that I need to set before I can um, initiate my blast with this button. And those parameters uh, define the database that you'll blast against, the blast program that you'll use, and the query sequences that, that you'll use. So for this example, I'm interested in proteins. And, um, and then I'm given the choice between two BLAST subprograms. All of these parameters have help information here, and you can look to see what um, these BLAST subprograms do. You can also look on the NCBI uh, page and read information there. It's very uh, detailed. Um, so I'm going to stick with BLAST P and then uh, to define my or my database, I can search against all of the organisms that we have in uh, vector base or um, just a subset. And I'm going to choose 80s organisms. And now for my um, query sequences, I can upload a file if I want using this uh, tool here, or I can just cut and paste into this, which I which is what I think I'll do. I have four sequences already chosen. Uh, sequences need to be in FASTA format, which um, you know, which includes a def line. The um, information the, in the definition line will become the name of the sequence on our BLAST results. So you can make that as detailed as you like. So I'm going to um, uh, copy all of these and then paste them into this text box. Um, I'll give my job a name. And then right here, we have a bunch of advanced uh, BLAST parameters. Um, uh, you know, so these are chosen by our bioinform bioinformaticians to do the most commonly run BLAST. Um, if you want to do something a little bit more detailed, you can change these um, to suit your needs. But for me, I'm just going to run a common blast. And so I'll leave these as default and click um, click blast to run my job. So um, the blast results have a summary at the top and then two tabbed uh, pages of results. The summary has your job and reminds you of your name and, and the um, database that you set up and searched. The combined results, which we're looking at now, um, show all of the hits for all of the sequences that you blasted. And we can see there were 102 genes uh, returned by this, uh, by this blast. And they're listed here, each one in a different line. Um, so you can, you know, uh, open up this and read more about the protein product. There's more information about the statistics returned by the BLAST over here. And then you can also um, download these results in a number of different formats. The individual results um, is where you can view detailed results for each query that you sequenced, right? So I'll go ahead and choose my second sequence. And then uh, I'm given three tabbed pages here. The first one is just a regular BLAST result. Uh, here are all of the sequences that showed similarity to my query sequence and the uh, BLAST statistics over here. If I scroll down a little bit further, I can view the alignments. 
The second page here is a more typical view of um, ViewPath DB results, um, where the first column here is the gene ID, and then we have associated data with that. Uh, uh, I can use this add columns to add any data that I want to to this table. For example, if I want to um, know about expression of these of these genes, I can I can add a graph to the um, to my table here and look at each of these genes that way. So the uh, third, I'm having trouble. Um, so the third uh, page in these results, in our BLAST results, is a genome view. And that shows um, the BLAST hits mapped to uh, the genomic sequences or chromosomes to which they belong. Um, this is kind of graphic heavy, and I guess well, it's taken a while to load. Um, but again, you can download these results in a bunch of different formats. And then you can also send these to the um, search strategy system. And the advantage of this, as we'll see, um, or as partly probably you already know, is that you can also um, look at any of the other data that we want in relation to these um, BLAST genes. And we'll demo that a little bit more later. So to get back to my, um, uh, your jobs are always saved in your My Blast Jobs page. So I'm going to my workspace and clicking My Blast Jobs. And there I am back to the, um, the searches that I ran this morning. There's three pages here. Uh, I can go back and also initiate a new job there. So that's uh, our multi sequence blast. Great, thank you, Suzanne. And uh, again, if you have any questions um, or, or uh, interest in multi-seq blasts and have more questions, go ahead and, um, and send us an email or ask the question here in the webinar. Uh, we're gonna switch over now to uh, Evelina, who is gonna uh, describe what's new in fungi DB and host DB. So Eve, uh, go ahead, it's, uh, it's yours. And we can see your screen. Mm -hmm. All right, sounds good. Thanks very much, Omar. All right, I'm on the news notes for FungiDB release 51, and we have quite a few data sets that we integrated in um, uh, this time around. So in addition to new data sets, we have also updated names for various organisms using the NCBI taxonomy database, which is shown in this table. And if I scroll down a little bit further down the uh, page, you will notice that uh, we have um, a list of new genome sequence and annotations, also new genome sequences available in FindGDB, and also some of the genomes were reloaded uh, to integrate the latest assemblies or uh, gene annotation. Amongst the new genome sequences and annotations, we have loaded uh, several uh, pathogens, and that includes human and plant pathogens, for example, Aspergillus, Blastomyces, and Blastomyces um, are the two isolates is one that is virulent and the other one is not. And we also have six genomes for Canada, including the genome for Canada auris, is uh, an emerging pathogen that is quite often resistant to multiple antifungal drugs. And we also have uh, genomes of, uh, from the group of melanized yeast, such as Exophila, or um, in, we also integrated the clinical isolates of Molossesia restrictor, or we um, have a genome, which is a plant genome, Virginia striiformis, that causes um, rust in, in wheat. So I will go ahead and demo really quick how you can search uh, the uh, genome data set and navigate to the gene record page for uh, Canada Oris uh, B11221. And I navigate to this page simply by clicking on the link uh, in blue here. The, the record page for this data set contains additional information that will allow you to gather more information about the species and the group um, that have produced um, 
this uh, sequence and annotation. And also pick several uh, options that you can uh, use to explore this data set. Notice that you can identify genes based on various uh, parameters and also look at the genomic sequences. I will run, uh, I'll click to run a uh, search using a transmembrane domain count. And I will look for a CANDA or a strain 11 right here. And as far as the minimum and maximum number of transmembrane domains, I will leave them as default. And if, if I click get answer, you, um, what you will get back is essentially a, um, a one-step strategy. And I'll close the previous one. Is a one-step strategy that returns the number of genes that uh, fall within the criteria that you have specified. And if you scroll down a little bit further, notice that a lot of uh, proteins that were returned in the search are actually transporters it will be, uh, using the um, uh, product description view to judge this. So it looks like our results make sense. And notice that you have an option to add a step so you can always uh, expand your strategy and add additional steps looking at uh, transcriptomics data or even uh, look for orthologs in other Canada forest species. Okay, so coming back to the other genomes that we have loaded, we have also a genome sequence for a number of genomes, and that includes human pathogens, plant pathogens, um, and also biocontrol and endophytic fungi. And I will take a look at the Verticillium delium genome sequence. And uh, this is a plant pathogens that causes um, wilt, uh, vascular wilt, wilt in plants. Notice if we, if we scroll down um, the page, uh, we notice that the options to identify genes are missing compared to the previous screen that we just have seen for C. auris, and that's because we this genome for this genome only sequence was available and not annotation. However, you can still run searches using the genomic sequences approach, and for example, here I can um, look for the uh, DNA motif pattern or just identify sequences based on an organism. And in this case, if I click on the um, on the search to run. I'll make sure that I have selected Dahlia. And if I click on getting answer button, I'll generate the result that for this organism, there are eight sequences that are available. And these sequences are essentially the eight chromosomes um, that were assembled for uh, verticillium. And if and when the uh, genome annotation becomes available for this organism, we'll make sure to integrate this as well so that we can have other searches available for you as well. So coming back to the news, I'll scroll down and also wanted to mention that we integrated a number of um, omic scale data sets, uh, for example, for SNP analysis and also uh, transcriptomics data. Um, I will briefly demo the SNP data for um, uh, Paricularia oryzae, and this is a plant fungus that decimated um, rice fields in Bangladesh and India. And uh, I'll navigate to the dataset record page. And again, I'll select the type of search that I would like to um, run. So for the data for which we have SNPs and when the genomes are assembled on the chromosomal level, we have several types of searches available, such as copy number variation. And for any SNP data set, you can also run a SNP characteristic search. And what the search allows you to do is first, you will arrive to a window to specify the search parameter. And in this case, I'm interested to run my search on this specific data set that we integrate in release 51. But I also want to look for different types of SNPs because the SNP can, um, uh, the SNP allows you to uh, identify various types of SNPs such as coding, non-coding, nonsense, synonymous. And in my case, I am interested um, in looking for non-synonymous SNPs. And I will modify my parameters just a little bit more to increase the st stringency of my search, such as I want to have 40% of isolates with a base call, and I also want to have at least five SNPs of the above class in the gene. And so I'll go ahead and run uh, my search. And when the um, 
search produces the results. So I'll scroll down a little bit to, um, to view the results table. Notice that the genes that are listed, there are um, quite a few genes that are hypothetical, but uh, you also get the statistics for the SNPs, for the types of SNPs, and the number of SNPs that are detected within each gene. So we know that non-synonymous mutations often contribute to various um, uh, to pathogenicity or virulence in fungal pathogens. So it could be actually quite interesting to look further at the hypothetical proteins identified here that carry several non-synonymous SNPs. And if you were to uh, navigate to a gene record page for one of the genes returned in a search, you can also examine the additional data that we have for every gene. The we are currently on the gene record page, which is an encyclopedia type of uh, record. And if I click on the SNP button, I am automatically redirected to the genetic variation data that contains information about um, the SNPs. And notice that the genes that I have, the gene that I have selected to take a look at contains multiple SNPs. Non-synonymous are those highlighted in dark blue. Nonsense SNPs are in red and so forth. And you can examine this data further clicking on JBrush Genome Browser or also visualizing uh, more data within the gene record page. Okay, so I'll jump back to the FungiDB news page. And I wanted to quickly talk about the transcriptomics data. We have a variety of data sets integrated and this data is not only for the fungal pathogen, but also for the host component, such as human cells. So you can technically search uh, uh, the data sets in FungiDB and in HostDB, which is the database that holds host data sets and identify genes that are upregulated during infection in both host and the pathogen. And I will, um, to demonstrate the transcriptomic search, I will jump back to host DB. And as Amar mentioned, we um, have the same infrastructure. So uh, the search will look just the same in FungiDB and host DB. To navigate to the recently integrated RNA-seq for host, I will um, use the the filter box to navigate to the RNA-seq evidence page. And this is essentially a list of data sets that we have available in HostDB. And notice quite a few of them are also for fungi. And these data sets include uh, various pathogens such as candida pathogens, Labrata tropicalis, um, and also uh, mucor. And this is one of the this is one of the data sets that we integrated and that I would like to demo further. So the interesting, uh, uh, the interesting uh, thing about this data set that it's quite unique because it have looked at the, um, at the human cells when they were stimulated with candida um, albicans and candida auris cells and also their cell wall components. And this data set came from the group of Mihai Nitea and what we can do in HostDB is actually look at the expression of uh, genes in human cells when they're exposed to candida live um, cells. So let's go ahead and set up uh, a search. So what I would like to do is first to run my first uh, step of the strategy. And I would like to look for the genes that are upregulated by fivefold and then to select two samples. The first sample is the control sample, which is RMI control media at 24 hours. And the second sample will be the, um, the human cells that were actually incubated with candida albicans cells for 24 hours. And so what I want to see is uh, I want to identify any genes that are upregulated in response to exposure to live candida albicans cells. And now I'll click on get answer. So notice that we have returned 115 genes. They're also listed on the, in the results table here. But um, I would to add another step and actually compare the genes that are upregulated between the, um, the two samples, Canada and ORS. So I'll go ahead and click on Add Step, use the filter to select RNA-seq evidence, and uh, navigate to the same data set using a full change. And in this case, I will uh, select uh, the same settings, such as I'm looking for upregulated genes. They're upregulated by fivefold. 
my control media is still the same, such as human cells incubated for 24 hours in the control media, but my uh, compar comparison sample is different. I'm interested in choosing uh, the sample where cells were incubated with Candida auris live. And so when I click on run the step, notice that um, by default, I chosen to uh, return only genes that are essentially the intersection result. That means that these genes are shared between the two samples, that 82 genes are upregulated in the samples where cells were exposed to Candida albicans and in the samples where cells were exposed to Candida auris. However, we uh, have a, a quite unique tool where you can change the uh, Boolean operator that you have chosen to, for example, identify only those genes that are uniquely upregulated in response to Canada live cells. And you can also change this Boolean operator to look for genes uniquely upregulated in response to Canada auris. And so notice that there's quite a few genes um, upregulated in response to Canada worse than albicans. And um, although I'm not an immunologist, but this is maybe something of interest to uh, follow up. Um, to analyze this type of data, we have also a few options for you here, such as analyze the results. And you can analyze the data using gene ontology, metabolic pathways, or word enrichment approaches. And if you look at the uh, gene ontology, that's simply a way to visualize your data where you can unify different organisms across um, different uh, data sets using a controlled vocabulary to characterize three biological processes. And for example, if I look at the molecular function where the, uh, they is associated with the genes that are regulated in response to Canada auris and um, essentially uh, prioritize them based on the number of genes enriched in my sample, which is the 82 genes um, above, notice that a lot of uh, activity that is annotated by Go ontology is associated with um, immune, immune response. So I think that from this standpoint, it, my, data in the, um, my data in the search that I constructed actually makes sense because you would expect the um, human cells responding with activation of genes that are necessary um, during the um, uh, in infection with Canada auris. Okay, and finally, in the last uh, minute or two, I also wanted to mention that we have a number of phenotypic data that was in in integrated as a manual curation effort by our team. And the phenotypic data were curated from the various publications mentioned within the text and we have annotated hundreds of genes with new phenotypes. And here, just a quick search. If you click on the manually curated phenotypes for Cryptococcus, and we also integrated this data for Aspergillus and um, Pericularia arisi. But if you click on the phenotype, it will take you to a data set um, search page where we provide a little bit more information about how we create this data, but also an option to search the data set. And if you click on the search the phenotype, I will choose the Cryptococcus neoformans GE seq, and that's um, and we'll look for anything that has a decreased amount of capsule organization. And capsule is important for virulence. And click on get answer. And similarly, once you return a number of genes, you can combine this search with other types of data. And um, I, I think. Um, this will conclude the updates for FungiDB. Great, thank you, Eve. Um, we're going to go ahead and uh, keep moving on. So I'm going to take over the controls and um, talk to you about updates, uh, recent updates in TriTripDB and uh, VectorBase. Uh, I wanted to quickly, there was a question uh, which was answered, uh, if you didn't see it, about BLAST and whether you can download the results. And the answer is yes. So for everybody's benefit, you will see here there's a, a drop-down menu that allows you to do download all results. And when you select this, you have many different options, uh, and including uh, CV CSV, which allows you to then open this in uh, an Excel file, for example. Um, 
Okay, so back to uh, the homepage of TriTrip DB, and I'm going to go to the news again, just so you can see what is new in the latest release of TriTrip DB. And you can see there are two basic um, updates. One is this update to a uh, subserial localization data set. So this is coming from the trip tra tag uh, project. Um, and this is an incredible data set where they fused uh, a fluorescent protein to uh, the C terminal and N terminal uh, uh, part of almost um, all the genes. In this case, it's 7,487 genes in uh, Trypanosoma brucei 927. Uh, and so this is a, a beautiful way for you to quickly see if your protein of interest has a uh, particular localization. Um, and, and of course, having both the C terminal and N terminal is quite useful. Um, the other updates is there's, we have updates to um, annotation, uh, which is ongoing. And uh, you will see here, these are the summary of the updates and you can go in and click on any of these and get more details, including integration uh, of um, updates from um, user comments. And if you're not familiar with what user comments are, uh, it's basically a way for any of you to add a comment on a gene uh, you just log in and add the comment. The comment becomes available publicly immediately and you're sharing your knowledge with the rest of the community. It's a crowdsourced way of, of sharing your knowledge and it's actually quite quite successful. We have uh, hundreds upon hundreds of user comments on, on gene pages. So the only demo I'm gonna show you in TriTripDB is to go to this TripTag project uh, data set. You'll get, get more information about it here um, and, and details on how the experiments were done, including a listing of um, of the searches that are available. So in this case, you can identify genes based on uh, their cellular localization or imaging. I wanted to point out that we've been accessing these searches through the news just because we're starting with the news as the, the place to see what's new in the latest release of, um, of the database. But if I go to the homepage, you will notice all these structured searches on the left here uh, are available to, to you to, to query. And in fact, the subcellular localization, so I'll just start typing cellular right here, you'll notice that there's cellular localization imaging searches right here. And this is the same search that I would have gotten to from the news. So if I click on this, I can select uh, whether I want an N-terminal or C-terminal fusion. Um, this is my, my, I tried this earlier, so I selected cilium, right, which will go to, the, to see anything that's localized to the flagella. I click on get answer. Uh, the cool thing about this is that you get a listing of genes where the localization of a C-terminally fused uh, GFP uh, or, or fluorescent protein uh, localized to the, the, the cilium or the flagellum in this case. And when you scroll down, you get a listing of all of these genes. And if you scroll to the right here, you'll notice that we have images of all of these genes. These images on the results page, we're only showing you a single fluorescent image of this C-terminal tag version of the protein. But you may be interested in knowing, well, I wanna see what other, other images that they have. So I'm just gonna go to the gene page for this second gene. Um, and on the gene page, again, there's the gene page is huge. There's a lot of data in there, and it it it, it gets a little bit overwhelming sometimes. Sometimes, but we have this um, categorical uh, uh, division of the gene page, which allows you to quickly also search through it. So I can start typing uh, cellular localization, for example, and you'll see that uh, it, it filters down to cellular localization. Now I can click on this; it'll take me to the section. Here are the images that we were looking at. And you can see a C terminal image and an N terminal image. And I can click on any of these, and this will give me an expanded view of this image. And then you can, you know, you can zoom in more and, and explore this further. So it's 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 a pretty cool data set. Uh, and I would encourage you to um, to explore it if you're interested in subcellular localization. Um, the cool thing about this obviously is that you can find things based on their localization in T brucei, but then ask, well, are there orthologs of these genes in um, in Leishmania, for example. And then by, by similarity and orthology, you can deduce that maybe it has a similar localization based on, on the TBCI data. All right, I'm gonna to jump to uh, vector base quickly. And in vector base, I wanna highlight a couple of things before I switch it over to Sam, who's gonna describe some of the population biology data that's available in vector base. Um, we have, uh, at the top here, you'll notice there's a, a special uh, release note about uh, upcoming webinars. We've uh, we've developed a number of webinars that we'll present to be presenting over the next few weeks, uh, specifically about using VectorBase as the the demonstration uh, platform. Uh, but of course, anything you learn in VectorBase will be applicable to all of our databases because it's all built on the same infrastructure as I mentioned before. Uh, but 
but I would encourage you, especially if you're new to view path DB resources, each of these webinars will be quite uh, useful uh, to you. Uh, our first webinar ran last week, and so if you missed it, no worries. Uh, go to our webinar page, and you can you can uh, review that uh, YouTube recording. And then we have an upcoming webinar on building complex strategies. So if you're interested in knowing how to add steps to your strategy, uh, to ask questions across different data types, like you want to know about an RNA sequence data set, intersector results with a microarray, and a proteomics data set, and so forth, um, come to this webinar. And then we have uh, further webinars on, on uh, deep exploration of transcriptomics data and analyzing your own data in Vectorbase using our Galaxy platform. Um, moving down, in terms of um, new data sets in uh, release uh, 51, um, again, we have the same new features, so we've covered those. Um, you will see here that there are two new genomes that were added. Uh, so the Aedes uh, albopictus, uh, so this is the tiger uh, mosquito. Uh, I see those in my backyard in the summer. They're very nasty. Uh, and then we have Calicoides, um, uh, which is the, a midge. And obviously, both of those are, are vectors of, of various pathogens. Uh, we included both the genome and annotation. Again, if you click on any of these, it will give you more information about that particular uh, genome, the publication, uh, the provenance of the genome, its accession number in in, um, in GenBank, for example, or in, in the INSDCs, um, and also a list of all the available searches. So I can go in quickly and say, well, I want to I want to see all the genes from this particular um, organism that have uh, transmembrane domains, for example. And so I can I can filter my um, uh, my um, list of organisms, select the organism of interest, and I want to find uh, genes that have at least seven transmembrane domains and a maximum of 12, so I can configure this and run my search. Anyway, the point of this is that you can run any kind of search on any of the genomic data that we load, uh, because all of the genomes go through our standard analysis pipeline. We predict transmembrane domains, signal peptides. Um, we align, if there's any functional data, like RNA-seq or so forth, we align it to the genome and make it available to you. So I'm going to um, stop here, and I'm going to switch it over to you, Sam, so you can describe the map, map view and maybe some of the um, highlights of what has been integrated in the in the most recent um, release. So I'll make you the presenter. Thanks, Omar. OK, uh, and okay. you should be the presenter now. There we go. There we go. Yes, yeah, so I'll be showing the uh, map view uh, feature, which is previously known as Top Bio, and you can access it from the Vectorbase uh, homepage uh, by going to uh, Tools Map View, and we will be uh, eventually uh, rolling this out to other sites as we get uh, relevant data. Um, so I'll mostly be doing a quick overview of some of the features, but um, uh, please do reach out and we can always answer more questions. So we have a number of specialized views that depend on the different kind of data. And we've been adding uh, quite a bit of insecticide resistance data uh, in the last release or two because we've been working with IR Mapper to share our curatorial uh, efforts. Um, so this is the, uh, the genotype view. And I can do things such as, you can see our search bar here, you can filter by species or other things using the uh, auto-complete uh, drop-down box. But instead, I'm going to use the facet uh, menu on here. I'll switch to locus. I'll filter just by this KDR L1014 locus, uh, switch back to allele, and then I can zoom in to disaggregate. And we can see uh, the lilac breakdown at uh, different uh, collection locations. Uh, so here I'll uh, look at a different kind of data that we are always constantly um, adding. Um, and this is population abundance data, uh, population dynamics. Um, and you can see I can, uh, for example, instead of adding a uh, search filter, I'll remove a search filter and the uh, graph will uh, automatically change to reflect that. Um, most of the data that we have uh, for abundance data it comes from uh, US mosquito abatement districts, and we're constantly adding new data sources. But 
uh, we are making uh, a push to, to really try to get uh, population dynamics from Gambia complex mosquitoes in sub-Saharan Africa. So we would always be interested in having a conversation if you have data you'd like to have us host. Um, I will look here. So this is insecticide resistance uh, phenotypes. So before I showed you uh, genotypes, um, and as you can see, I can, for example, filter by a particular uh, insecticide or class. Um, and instead of a timeline graph, for example, we get a graph of uh, the uh, results of the assays. And we really try to get very uh, high resolution data that shows kind of the raw experiments. So you can see uh, the metadata for all the different assays that um, <clears throat> underlie our data points here. And so this is our graph view. But we also have, you can explore the data as a tabular view. You can download the data as a CSV file, so you can do your own downstream analysis. You can do a shared link. So let's say you want to send your colleague like this view right here. You can click on that share button and, and send, them, uh, send them that. And finally, I'll show you uh, some other quick views. For example, this is pathogen infection data view. So you can see the number of assays versus the number of positive assays. Here I filtered uh, just by West Nile virus in one species uh, from a certain date. And for blood meal analysis, um, <clears throat> you can see uh, uh, here we've broken it down by, um, by what the host blood meal source of the mosquito was over time from this one location. Um, and as Omer mentioned, we're always constantly um, adding new data sets, and you can see those data sets that we added uh, <clears throat> on our news page. And I think this release, uh, we were fairly heavy on uh, insecticide resistance um, uh, uh, data sets. Uh, thank you. All right, thanks, Sam. Um, I'll go ahead and um, take controls here. Um, so uh, the next thing I'm going to do is um, quickly highlight some of uh, the new updates in PlasmoDB. I'll try and be very quick so I can switch it back to Suzanne as she's going to cover a number of, uh, of features um, and, and wrap, uh, wrap things up. So PlasmoDB, again, I'm looking in the news section so you can see what's been added just in the last uh, release. Uh, we release about every two months, and so there's there are new updates on a regular basis. Um, I think one thing that uh, if you work on Plasmodium, uh, one thing that uh, you should be very aware of is that for uh, two of the genomes, Plasmodium falciparum uh, 3D7 and Plasmodium vivax, uh, they both uh, got um, UTRs added to them, so untranslated regions, uh, which uh, makes a difference obviously in the gene model and, and the way we are calculating RNA-seq data expression values. So that's something you just want to make sure you pay attention to. Um, if you uh, ran a search in the past before this update, you may notice some changes in the expression values of your of your gene of interest. Um, we've also added uh, a new uh, genome sequence of hepatocystis. Uh, this is uh, uh, related to um, Plasmodium. Obviously, it causes uh, I think it causes blue tongue disease, um, and this is from a naturally infected um, Colobus monkey. Uh, and again, this is the genome, and and with its um, with its uh, annotation, in inclu including a transcriptome that was used to to call or make the gene model calls, and so you can actually view this in the genome browser. We loaded a number of transcriptomics data sets. These are all, um, I believe, RNA seq data sets, and you can see from the description they range from uh, just interspecific cycle uh, experiments to uh, transcriptomes from both uh, um, uh, severe or uncomplicated malaria cases. Uh, down to uh, P. Berg liver stages. Uh, again, I won't demo these searches specifically. You've seen them before, and we will have a whole webinar in a couple of um, in a few weeks uh, that will just go into transcriptomics data sets and vector based. But the same tools, same searches will be applicable to any of our uh, resources. Moving down, we have ChIPSeq ChIPSeq data. This is represented in the genome browser. So when you click on this, you can get more information of, about this data set and view it in the genome browser and, and, and see where you have peaks of, um, of uh, these different histone modification binding sites. Um, and then finally, in PlasmoDB, we also integrated a number of um, uh, annotation updates, uh, which are listed here. And you can go in here and get more information about you know, each of these updates if you are interested in drilling down to the details. 
So I think I will I will stop here without any demos in PlasmoDB just because of the interest of time. And I'll uh, Suzanne, I'm going to switch it over to you um, to finish up the rest of the databases and um, wrap things up for us. Okay, sounds good. All right, Suzanne, sorry, I think I muted you instead of making you the presenter. Now you're the presenter. So. Yeah, I was wondering what was happening there. Nobody wanted to listen to me, I guess. <laughs> muted, All unmuted, right. unmuted, unmuted. All right, All right. so yeah, let's go over um, what is new in, um, I want to get rid of the screen. There we go. Uh, what is new in ToxoDB? And to, you know, the best way to do that is to look at the news. And what we see, we have two new data sets in uh, release 51. One of them is a transcriptomics data set. And this is RNA sequence, that uh, data that describes the transcriptome during infection in the mouse. It's from a 2020 publication. And in release number 50, we integrated the host uh, portion of this data, and you can find that in um, HostDB. So all of the searches that uh, Eve demoed would be available on, the, on this data too. We also have a proteomics data set which describes the tachyzoite secretome of parasites isolated from infected mice. Um, so for this experiment, the authors isolated para parasites from infected mice and then collected secretions in vitro and determine the peptide sequences of the proteins found in their the uh, secretions they collected. And then we mapped those peptides back to the genome, uh, created a way for you to search that, and we added that um, data uh, into graphs and images on the on the gene pages. All right, so let's um, look at one of the searches uh and um and look at this data so i'll go up let's go to the gene page this this menu is the same as this search for menu here and what i want to do is search for genes based on proteomics and mass spec evidence and then i'm taken to my search page all of the experiments are listed here that have peptides mapped back to genomes, but I want to look at the secretome. And here's my experiment here, and I'm going to choose the th three secretome samples and run my search looking for uh, genes that had pro have mapped proteins from those samples, peptides. And I find that I have um, 920 genes uh returned by the search these are genes whose protein products were found in the secretions of parasites isolated from infected mice <laughs> i know that's a mouthful um, and this is really great you can um, see a list and you know add data to the to this um uh to this table here but you know you kind of could get the same thing from the publication just by downloading their uh their data table. But the wonderful thing, the advantage of having this data in ToxoDB is that you get to consider it in relation to all of the other data that we have. So let's go ahead and do that. I'm going to go ahead and add a step, hopefully, and combine this data with other, uh, combine these results with other data from searches. It turns out in we have um, phenotype data from a genome-wide CRISPR study that where I could look for essential genes, the phenotype score, the lower the phenotype score, uh, the more essential it is. So I'm going to go from um, negative almost seven to negative five and run the step and intersect uh, these essential genes with my 920 from uh, from my mass spec results and it turns out that i have 82 genes that are um, determined to be essential by a crispr screen um, out of these others that are in mass spec um, now i, I want to show you um, what the data looks like on the gene pages so i'm going to go back to my mass spec search results 
um, and and go to a gene page somehow with um, possibly heat shock protein. So I'll open up that gene page and go to the proteomics section here. And what I see is um, all of these peptides mapped to this um, to the length of the protein. Each one of these is a peptide. If I click on it, I can get the peptide sequence of what aligned there. Um, and up here in this table, I have um, a summary date data for that experiment. So that's what I wanted to show you in ToxoDB. Let's go to AmoebaDB. Um, and I'm going to go again to the news. Um, and what we see is that we have one proteomics experiment uh, added in release 51 to AmoebaDB. And this proteomics data, uh, instead of collecting peptide data, the authors collected abundance data associated with the proteins found in their samples. They compared uh, the proteins found in parasites that were treated with um, metronidazole versus aurinofen. Um, and then what they collect are, are numbers instead of peptides. So that opens up an entirely different type of query that we can do. And I'm going to um, demo that here for, um, I'll go to searches. I want to search for genes based on proteomics and quantitative mass spec evidence. Uh, amoeba DB, we only have this one experiment. I'm going to use the fold change search to look for protein coding genes that are upregulated 1.5 fold um, using the AF uh, sample versus the um, methotrexate, I mean, uh, metronidazole sample. And I'll click get answer. Um, and I find that I have uh, 345 genes that are upregulated 1.5 fold or more in the um, metronidazole sample, which again, you know, I probably could have found that from the publication. But what's great is that we also um, can analyze these results uh, looking for GO enrichment, metabolic pathway or word enrichment. And I will demo uh, GO enrichment. I think Eve did this also. So I'm going to look to see if there are um, enriched GO terms assigned to these 345 genes. I want to look at the biolo biological process ontology for um, these, these genes and click Submit. Now it's running a statistical analysis looking for enrichment of GO terms. Um, and what I'm given back is a table of enriched GO terms based on um, uh, Fisher's exact test. And these p-values are relatively significant. Um, I can um, see that some of these GO terms are include nitrogen compound biosynthesis, amide uh, metabolic processes, which we would expect when we're um, treating parasites with these, um, with these compounds. So uh, we, we have two more minutes. I wonder if we should ask, ask for questions. Um, uh, we can, we can, yes. And maybe you can show pyroplasma DB or sorry, if maybe, or maybe you showed it already. I don't know. <laughs> um, no, I didn't, I didn't. Uh, okay. I went out of order because I wanted to compare those two types of protein um, searches and the two types of protein data that we have. So yeah, you know, yeah, pure plasma, mm -hmm. yeah we also had um, whole genome sequencing of of isolates, we had six uh, Babesia microti isolates that we added. Um, we imported the sequence reads and aligned them to our reference genome, uh, Babesia microti, and, and then we calculated um, single nucleotide polymorphisms from that. Um, and we have some really great searches. I guess if there's no questions, I'll just go ahead and um, demo that. We can search for genes based on SNP characteristics. So we're looking for genes that have, um, I'm going to, yeah, choose our BC microti isolates. Uh, we, 
we've already calculated single nucleotide polymorphisms here, and now we're using this search to cross-reference them to genes. Um, and I'm going to look for uh, genes in the uh, coding regions. Um, I mean, SNPs that are in the coding regions of genes. And, and I find that I have um, find 60 genes uh, that have SNPs from that data set in, in their coding regions. I can go to the gene pages and look at the SNP uh, data there. We're looking at this gene, right? And I'll zoom to that region and every one of these things, it, um, Every one of these little diamonds is a, is a uh, SNP. You can click on that and get more information about it. You can also go to that um, SNP uh, gene page. And then in more detail, you can look at the reads associated with each of those um, SNP calls uh, just in, in JBrowse. OK. Great. Thanks. <clears throat> I think um, uh, unless we have any more questions um i think that's it we really really appreciate you guys coming and um check out our webinar page for for more webinars all right thank you everybody bye-bye bye-bye